Good evening. Hello. My name is Molly Ilbrock, and I'm the Director of Corporate Communications here at ESMT Berlin. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's ESMT Open Lecture, Trust and Security in a Digitalized Society with Haley Turma-Kha. Haley joined the Digital Society Institute at ESMT as its director on January 1st of this year. She brings a decade or decades of experience with her in cybersecurity. She recently, most recently, served as ambassador at large for cyber diplomacy and as director of the cyber diplomacy department of the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Prior to that role, she was responsible for cyber policy and cybersecurity issues at the European Union External Action Service, including the development and implementation of the cybersecurity strategy for the EU. We're very, very happy to have her with us at ESMT Berlin, and we're very happy to have her with us this evening. Tonight's event will be moderated by Lawrence Serulis, the global security correspondent at Politico. We're very happy to have him with us as well, and we will be taking questions from the audience at, in, at every time in the Q&A, so you can put them into the Q&A, and after Haley's lecture, there'll be a small discussion between her and Lawrence, and then we will take questions from the floor. So that's it from me. I'm looking forward to the lecture and glad to have you all there. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Molly, for introducing us. And uh, uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to talk about trust and security in digitalized society today here. We are now uh, experiencing the major uh, breaking point in our um, digital uh, future. Digital technologies are profoundly impacting our economies and societies. While the previous three industrial revolutions were fostered by water and steam power, electric power, and more recently electronics and information technologies, the coming wave of high impact di digital technologies are characterized by use of data in a fusion of technologies and blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. We are only seeing the beginning of this transformation. As technologies are increasingly maturing, their impact is accelerating, carrying a promise of increased prosperity and solutions to some of our most pressing societal problems, but also the risk of social disruptions and increased inequality. Europe is well positioned to capture the value of the next wave of digital transformation, inclusively and sustainably, to the benefit of all Europeans. Proactive actions will be needed on all levels to boost the development and adoption of digital technologies and managing the transition and its risks. The digital compass and the path to the digital decade call for greater leadership and the common vision for 2030. It sets out that EU's digital ambitions are to have our citizens skilled in digital um, transformation. We should also make sure that we have secure and sustainable digital infrastructures. We should transform our businesses and public services. By 2030, the cumulative GDP contribution of such digital technologies could amount to 2.2 trillion in the EU which is equivalent to the current Spanish and Dutch uh, GDPs, for instance. Raising the investment level of private and public actors in digital technologies and sk digital skills is essential to happen. For example, e-health solutions in Germany and France can bring savings of 55 billion euros, while only 5% um, of financing is automated and mobility technology is uh, not very digitalized yet. To achieve this, the analysis shows that member states and the EU need to contribute more funds to the digitalization and to make sure that there is um, a, an opportunity to educate, upskill and reskill the labor force in order to manage the digital transition. The global pandemic and the ensuing economic crisis have put digital technologies into the spotlight and highlighted the need for further action. The need for social distancing has accelerated the development and uptake of the technologies 
And we have also seen how um, the technologies have played an essential role in the public health response. Europe has launched a major recovery and resilience facility where 20% of the funds are earmarked for digital transformation. There are nine potential signature initiatives for Europe, which could help us to really capture the new phase of the transformation. First, deploying solutions for the challenges uh, that we have in climate, but also taking care of democracy, trust, privacy, diversity, boosting the economy and competitiveness, and making sure that we have enough technological capabilities and cybersecurity resources in Europe. However, we are uh, talking about um, our bright digital future most of the time, and also majority of the countries globally are looking forward to have more um, connectivity and uh, uh, they are looking forward to use technology for um, their social and economic progress. We see the numbers on the screen about the GDP growth in Africa and Latin America, if this digital transformation will be successful um, in those regions. But we are sitting here and we are still uh, in a way uh, in a situation where we do not have fully um, good understanding how we are dealing with the risks in digital society. And uh, this risk is something what we have to also uh, be able to manage. Can you help me? The risks related to our um, different um, aspects here uh, will be uh, mostly characterized by the global um, information infrastructures and global technologies which have been built not uh, with the security solutions in mind. We are now interconnected, as the current slide will show you. This is the undersea cables map which connects the network that connects all of us. So this uh, is li like our bloodline or lifeline, if you will. Um, of course, we have many other bits and pieces of digital technologies, but um, the point here is that we all are somehow like a global village and we have to make sure that we are using this global resource wisely uh, for the best of the future. And uh, sorry, I somehow get caught up in this um, changing slide thing. Here is the picture of the uh, positive side of digitalization. This is the street of Tallinn, where you see the um, uh, delivery robots uh, stuck in snow. Uh, this is uh, hopefully our biggest problem up to one week ago, what we had. Um, and um, all other positive. Um, aspects of the digitalization certainly need to be brought up but today's lecture is now um, also protect, um, projecting uh, a different picture of digitalization where we see the deficit and lack of trust why this lack of trust has been discussed um, and why we have arrived to this point is another question one of the reasons why the lack of trust uh, is still haunting us in this domain is the relative um, immaturity or newness or uh, uh, innovation phase of the digital technologies and ICT technologies. The whole ecosystem was not built to run major corporations and uh, critical infrastructures that all our societies depend on. The whole in, uh, system and internet was not uh, built with the idea in mind that um, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica cannot uh, collect data and somehow use it for political exploitation. And certainly it was not created with um, these objectives in mind that uh, uh, cyber attackers can take down major critical um, infrastructure companies. So. It has happened and we are suffering now like 6 trillion globally uh, of economic loss because of cybercrime and uh, intellectual property theft. 
Uh, there are several reasons why we are at this point of deficit of trust. First, uh, we know that information technologies were uh, not really created with security and safety features um, in the center of those technologies. We are still in the face of um, vulnerabilities in both software and hardware. And also we have seen that the market does not really prioritize security and privacy features in technology. The question is who has to prioritize security? Who pays for security? The usual response would be that this is the government who has to demand for more security and has to tell the corporations to uh, also invest into security. Well, governments have been quite slow in this uh, space. They have come into the play recently. They have not been uh, active in the first two decades when we call it like happy internet days when everything went online and e-commerce was booming and the problems haven't caught up with us yet. But we are still in this um, phase where governments try to do something, uh, companies try to lobby not to do uh, too much, and we do not uh, have um, the 100% of guarantee that um, all the good ideas that we also have from the technology side would be properly introduced, such as security by design concept in the technologies. And of course, uh, not um, last but not least, cyberspace has become a domain of geopolitical competition. Since it is a, a global domain, it is very attractive for different activities that uh, nation states would like to do. We have seen the rise of information operations, cyber attacks, and asymmetric warfare. We also have seen that cyberspace is increasingly used as a domain for military operations. This is uh, all the beginning of um, maybe a new era, what we um, have now witnessed in during last years, where certainly we have to do everything um, as um, governments, as the private sector, as academia, like us in order to make this domain more secure. This is here the definition of the digital domain. You can see that the domain is man-made. When we talk about the domains, usually it's a sea, land, um, space, uh, and, and these um, are not uh, made by the humans. But here we are talking about the man-made domain. So all the uh, good things we have created here are coming from us, so we have to also find the solutions, how we are dealing with the challenges. And uh, we have started to deal with the challenges. So first, we are increasingly uh, investing into more trustworthy computing and trustworthy technologies. Right now, um, technology experts would tell you that uh, majority of the security breaches and problems in digital uh, issues what we have uh, coming from uh, software vulnerabilities, which are called zero days, but um, I do not want to go too much into the technical side um, during the lecture today and give you more strategic um, overview. So um, those vulnerabilities in software need to be uh, patched uh, all the time, usually every month, sometimes every week, sometimes every two days. We still have malware, ransomware, human negligence, uh, all the other issues with our networks. There is a way to um, strengthen our technological base so that we will have less of the vulnerabilities. There is a uh, possibility to build more um, hassle-free systems uh, with user-controlled privacy, uh, which are more self-aware, self-adjusting and self-healing. And quite importantly, there is also a possibility to create security by design approach, uh, where software and hardware development uh, are uh, free of vulnerabilities and hard to attack, and also where the testing and authentication safeguards um, uh, are made in a way that they are uh, complying with the best programming practices. But we have to keep in mind that information technology um, has never built with security in mind. So we are still in this very difficult phase where um, we do not um, achieve in the near future 100% of security by security of, um, of design. So 
Um, we need to also make sure that we have a procedural, organizational, and other ways to secure the domain, not just technological uh, realities. Uh, so this is now the realization. We, the humans, created the domain. We have to fix it. Um, there is uh, a hope that, of course, we are able to fix it better in the future, and, and security will be um, uh, also integrated, and governments will be demanding more secure products. Uh, but we are still um, in this um, uh, moment right now in the uh, development of the digital technologies where um, not always is security the first um, priority. So we have here a quote from Steve Jobs, who is saying that technology is nothing. What is important is that you have faith in people, that they are basically good and smart, and, you, and when you give them the tools, they will do wonderful things with them. It's a very famous quote by uh, Steve Jobs, uh, stressing the responsibility of the users of technology. And uh, I also believe that since we created it, we have to fix it. How we fix it? We are uh, increasingly making very important steps um, to uh, approach the issue from economic rationale, also from national security rationale, and um, uh, how shall we say it, a more diplomatic, um, uh, global, international regulation rationale. ICT sector used to be one of those unregulated sectors. So I think there, um, there are many uh, comparisons made with the cars and planes, how safety features were not very important in the beginning when those technologies came to be used massively. And, and by now, one, after 100 years, we uh, basically are um, finally having quite well-working planes and well-working cars. Well, uh, some of our experts in the field of cybersecurity are saying that uh, in IT security uh, domain, we are still in the phase where if to uh, compare with the planes, then um, every 10th uh, plane will fall down because the ICT security is not at that stage of safety and security yet. Um, it is not only the matter of the government regulation, of course, but government regulation can help. Um, we had the stage uh, up to uh, the end of 21st or 2020th century where people believe that uh, history is over and uh, uh, everything to do with uh, digitalization and internet is um, a very happy uh, story. Uh, we also saw the concentration of market share to few players and the rise of the tech empires. I think the real wake up moment for most of the policymakers was when the Facebook was used for election interferences in the US and Europe after 2016. For the national security and um, cyber resilience community, the wake up call happened earlier. It was the 2007 um, large scale coordinated cyber attacks against Estonia that now retrospectively are attributed to Russia. Um, it was a cyber siege of three weeks, uh, which woke up the national security crowd and government started to set cyber standards um, in national security and critical infrastructure protection and addressing uh, fight with cyber crime after this year. We also had many voluntary public private partnerships and other very useful initiatives. But it was only after 2010 when the policymakers were getting more serious on regulation. And um, specifically in the European Union, the policymakers um, uh, were um, coming out with series of um, regulations on the field. It started with the GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, that served also as a very good educational process for the policymakers. And then uh, it went on with the Digital Single Market, E-Commerce Directive, and other regulations. Now, of course, we have Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act uh, under the discussions in the EU where uh, we see that um, the uh, 
privacy and uh, fundamental rights concerns and also um, comp competition concerns will be uh, addressed. Uh, and additionally, we see that the EU cybersecurity directives in 2016 and 2022, as well as a cybersecurity certification framework and the regulation of electronic identification and trust services is um, getting more and more um, uh, important. So those are real regulations which are compulsory for both the governments and the private sector. And EU is still the only large economic bloc which is um, already implementing or tries to implement these regulations. So you see it's not so easy to also make sure that your uh, regulation is proportionate, it does not create too much um, barriers, and it does not uh, create the issue what usually is called by the private sector compliance um, uh, um, kind of uh, systematic compliance without actually fulfilling the regulation. So uh, it is not easy to do the regulation. Uh, and I'm very glad to see that uh, policymakers in all uh, capitals of the European Union member states now are embarking on this. So we have um, the critical infrastructure and majority of our lifeline depending on the digital networks now. There is no major service that we are using every day, be it electricity, telecommunications, banking, or anything else, water, that does not depend on some sort of computer networks. Of course, what do you think who will mostly um, also use this opportunity um, to make sure that um, the politics is extended with, a, uh, with other means, as one of the famous Germans has said? These are the nation states. Cyberspace has become increasingly complex domain and also um, the domain that is exploited by the nation states. There are uh, some notorious cyber attacks, starting with nation state attacks with Estonia 2007. Uh, and now we see that uh, during the Ukrainian war, we have seen also the first phase when the cyber attacks uh, happened several days before the war. There are also uh, WannaCry and NotPetya as the most notorious globally uh, spreading uh, viruses that wiped out many companies and created $10 billion of um, economic loss. In addition to the notorious uh, nation state attacks, we also have the uh, low level persistent cyber conflict and uh, state tolerated ransomware which um, has been uh, one of the major nuisances for the governments in recent years, and of course the private sector actors. So um, we are now um, in the phase when um, our governmental and other responses to the nation state activities certainly um, have not stopped some of the nation states to use uh, cyber as a major domain of conflict. Uh, there is a list of useful uh, uh, mechanisms and useful consultations uh, on the screen now, starting with the United Nations uh, uh, different working groups, OSCE, NATO, EU, and uh, other useful initiatives. But of course, we also have international humanitarian law that says that you should not bomb hospitals, but some countries still do it. So that's a difficult road to regulate nation state behavior. Um, and then um, progress is done with very small steps. We also see um, a very worrying uh, new uh, method in, uh, in the whole digital and social media domain, which is using information as a weapon. Russian information warfare doctrine got renewed uh, after 2000. It has old roots, uh, the old tools are just applied in the social media era. Deception, active measures, um, uh, maskirovka, uh, misinformation, disinformation, making sure that you undermine public trust in the information that they get. And um, of course, it has uh, also been accompanied um, by the propaganda um, in domestic field that the West is an enemy and um, increasingly also glorifying the Second World War and war type of um, nostalgia in Russia. 
Um, we have seen many news and reports and felt it on ourselves how disinformation and cyber attacks have become part of the Russian playbook of the 2000s. Uh, we saw that this was used uh, before the major invasions in Georgia and Ukraine and also uh, this uh, election interference to destabilize Western democracies. So all the uh, different methods to um, sow discord, doubts, uh, exploit controversies and promote polarization have been used recently. This kind of um, um, disinformation and using information as the weapon is a, is a very difficult uh, asymmetric threat for all of us. And we as democratic societies have been uh, ha having a very difficult time to address it. Uh, slowly and surely we have um, been able to address it and, uh, and we still um, are talking with the Facebook and the other large uh, entities in the world how to do it. And of course, it was very encouraging to see the news this morning how Apple and uh, major other companies have um, uh, stopped the services um, uh, in Russia and, and really have helped um, uh, their own share to uh, end the conflict and war. So um, talking about the nation state behavior, I actually put uh, this topic, which is also very important in our discussion here today about lack of trust and security, cyber crime and cyber theft also under this nation state block, because what we see is uh, um, the um, phenomenon that lots of cyber crime, especially ransomware has been, we call it state tolerated or sometimes even state enabled. Many crime groups have been uh, used by certain countries um, in order to carry out um, the orders by the official structures. And of course, um, they are also doing their everyday work um, dealing with cybercrime. Um, Allianz has assessed that um, cyber risk is now the biggest business risk for the companies. And there are several reports with different numbers, but one of the numbers that comes up um, from European uh, Cybercrime Center and uh, more uh, authoritative sources is six, six trillion US dollars, 5.5, um, you know, 5.4 million a trillion euros um, that we lose globally for cybercrime. We also lose a lot of money for uh, intellectual property theft, which is more the Chinese um, specialty. And um, there are groups now targeting technology, defense, and medical research sector. We see these reports every day. Uh, how, how we react, how we respond as governments and international community to this threat. Cybercrime is, of course, not really nation state uh, type of threat. It is everywhere. It sometimes is tied to the nation states, but sometimes it's still um, economically driven. So we have been, as European countries, uh, promoting Budapest Convention and assisting developing nations to introduce uh, the related laws and also advancing global law enforcement cooperation. And of course, EU has harmonized its penalties for cybercrime. And there are the cyber um, uh, crime experts working with Europe. There are many other useful things that we are doing, uh, and we can discuss that at a later stage, but um, there is one more um, important um, topic I want to uh, introduce before we go to Q&A session. And um, this is the increasing um, authoritarianism also in internet. So the, the rising digital authoritarianism is um, uh, worryingly um, an increasing trend. Um, disinformation and propaganda uh, are uh, one part of the story, but uh, censorship and uh, mass censorship and um, uh, automated surveillance systems are also uh, quite worrying. So what uh, we have here uh, is a um, Freedom House Index, which countries are most free and which countries are most not free here. If you ask us why Iceland and Estonia are leading this, I think it's because um, we have not applied those algorithms that are trying to find terrorists. Uh, most of the European countries have to do this, and we luckily don't have that threat yet on our, at our doorstep. Uh, and of course, uh, as you can expect, uh, countries uh, on the bottom of the list, uh, Iran and China. And also here is the more global map about the internet freedom. 
where you see uh, mm, several um, colors. Uh, the green is free. Um, the rose is, I think, uh, also free, uh, uh, and uh, not free is uh, blue. And partly free is orange. So um, the digital um, authoritarianism uh, is not happening only on the internet. Uh, we, we know um, that um, some countries are also applying the facial recognition technologies, um, data analytics, uh, and the telecommunications um, tools in order to um, make sure that they have uh, efficient censorship. And the um, and European Union, for instance, has uh, put exports control um, on those technologies uh, outside the uh, European Union. So at least we Europeans cannot um, sell that kind of technology to the authoritarian regimes. Uh, our time stops here, and I would be very glad to have the Q&A session. Uh, and I, I think first, uh, Lawrence will ask some questions. Really, and thank you for um, for that that lecture. It was very very interesting. Um, maybe for those tuning in, um, I'll just quickly um, uh, introduce myself. I'm Lauren Cyrulus. Um, I cover cybersecurity for Politico um, in Brussels, um, and um, I've covered cybersecurity for a number of years now. And I've known Haley uh, since 2018, I believe, uh, when we first met met in Brussels. Um, and it's been an interesting couple of years um, as the cybersecurity debate has developed a lot. And as the debate developed, um, I sort of um, talked to Heli every um, every couple of um, couple of weeks and, and 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 months for her thoughts. And it's always been very very inspirational. Um, so I'm I'm very happy to moderate this session. Um, let me just um, uh, tell the audience once more that you can ask questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, functionality in the Q&A feature of Zoom. So don't hesitate and um, please uh, drop your questions there. Um, I will look at them and ask them um, to Haley. Um, this is an open discussion as much as possible. So please uh, do not hesitate to, uh, to fire uh, your questions in the Q&A uh, feature. Uh, but let me maybe first um, start with, um, so um, I believe your, your overview Haley has been uh, very informative. You've got to excuse my um, um, default as a journalist to ask the topical questions first. Um, so I would like to ask a little bit about what's on everyone's minds these days, which is the uh, Ukrainian, uh, the war going on in Ukraine, and uh, to what extent that has, has changed our perceptions of cybersecurity. Um, and if I had to phrase it in a question, um, I believe what a lot of people expected from uh, the Russian government um, and what we've seen in Eastern Europe in the past years uh, was sort of a very aggressive, sort of very um, um, active um, cyber uh, aggression and very active cyber, uh, cyber uh, offensive policy. Um, but what we haven't seen is cyber security sort of dominating or, um, or uh, effectively um, uh, defining uh, the war that we now see in Ukraine um, with the with the Russian invasion. My question is: To what extent has the conflict changed the way you see um, the role of cybersecurity as sort of um, a, a part of, of of conflict and 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 a part of war? Let me start there. Um, well, I think um, the question uh, is very good, and many, many, um, I think, uh, journalists and also experts are asking this, and uh, my Twitter feed is full of this kind of um, uh, discussion. Um, I think uh, we here have to also look at the more strategic picture. So, Russian uh, doctrine is to use cyber as some sort of add-on. So, uh, if necessary, they do it uh, for some uh, strategic political goals. For instance, uh, the cyber means were uh, very much deployed um, during the Georgian war and also the first Ukrainian war of uh, Krim, Krim uh, occupation and uh, intervention in Donetsk. Because this was uh, um, 
the stage where um, it was not so clear for the world um, community what exactly happens and who put their news first out was maybe believed more than the other side. So I think this kind of um, getting strategic advantage uh, and spreading their own message with cyber means has been one of the goals all the time. Uh, why to do this kind of um, cyber attacks together with disinformation uh, in the first stage of the conflict. In, in current conflict, um, I think we have to uh, also praise the very active um, publicization of the intelligence data that some of our allies have been doing. So um, uh, using disinformation and cyber attacks uh, uh, in, uh, in the situation when CNN is saying where exactly the troops are and how the troops are exactly moving, uh, exactly where on uh, either Russian Ukrainian border or Belarus uh, uh, Ukrainian border. So then we do not um, as, as me, see a need anymore for some sort of uh, information campaign. There, however, there have been um, cyber attacks before uh, the actual war started. Uh, there was uh, like a month ago, there was a big wiper attack, as you know, and, and also some other attacks were there in order to um, uh, destabilize the Ukrainian government and uh, make sure that uh, uh, they somehow have disturbed their systems. Um, and, and why this is not happening now during the active conflict? I mean, if they can bomb the electrical grids, why they need to cyber attack it? Because you can put the grids back after some time uh, of the cyber attack and bombing certainly is more effective if you want to render them totally destroyed and useless. So. Um, and it's interesting also that the many experts were predicting that because of the cyber attacks, uh, the war becomes more humane. Well, we haven't seen that happening actually in Ukraine. It's the same type of carpet bombing as we saw in Chechnya or in Syria. So this is uh, worrying. Yes, it's very worrying. I would prefer cyber attacks. I shouldn't still care. Great. Uh, maybe to follow up, and then I'll, I'll pick um, pick out a question uh, just sent in by Jörn, um, which I'll, I'll ask uh, in, in, in just uh, just a minute. Uh, but just to follow up, uh, I know you were very involved in the uh, sort of the, the design uh, of the, the the EU's own um, deterrence instruments. Uh, the cyber uh, diplomatic toolbox is the the the, the most prevalent example uh, that allows the EU to issue statements and also um, impose sanctions. Uh, looking at how we've seen sort of Russia's behavior in the past years since that toolbox has become in use. Um, do you consider that a success in its deterrence of Russian behavior? And if, if not, why, why has it failed to sort of deter? Um, um, this toolbox that we were um, working on and we implemented uh, was meant to be the peacetime toolbox, first of all. So, it was meant to uh, deter the rational actors with um, uh, objecti objective uh, uh, to be part of the world community and uh, also make sure that there is some sort of understanding between the governments, what is the responsible state behavior. Uh, certainly there are governments who do not care about this anymore or they ne have never cared and then we just didn't understand it properly. Uh, so, uh, um, I would not say that our toolbox was not efficient for all countries. Uh, we have seen the evidence that some countries were quite disturbed uh, when uh, their uh, nationals were put on the uh, sanctions list by the European Union. So, it's um, uh, something which still uh, merits uh, our uh, attention and we should uh, develop it further. But yes, uh, I would also agree that in case, in specific case of uh, Russian cyber aggress aggression, um, maybe the toolbox was not really um, the most useful tool. But uh, maybe uh, maybe there was still some influence by sanctions because uh, the sanctions usually are not working uh, exactly on the state structures and on those people who work already for the government but they uh, work on the, um, the second layer and the third layer. So some people might have thought twice after uh, applying sanctions by the European Union whether they want uh, to help the government to 
um, work on some sort of malicious code, for instance. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I will pick out a question. Um, the first one that was asked by Jörn um, Eichhorn, um, who's asking um, essentially that uh, the, the discussions internationally around cybersecurity uh, and the framework um, uh, that we create internationally and, and within the European Union, they're very complex ones. Uh, digital matters are very complex uh, topics to discuss across borders. Um, and so uh, Jörn's question is, which path for Europe uh, should Europe choose to achieve a more secure, democratically founded and economically balanced internet? So, um, which part, uh, which, uh, what is, uh, what, what, uh, the question actually, I think implies many things at the same time. So, um, I think um, when we are looking at this, um, which path for Europe, um, um, internet certainly is something that uh, is not only governed or decided by Europeans only, it's a global resource that is run uh, not by governments, but by something that we call multi-stakeholder model. So the multi-stakeholder model uh, has uh, been the only reason why we still have free internet, which is more or less interoperable in the continents, because if the, we had let the governments to also decide everything related with internet, then we would have the same style of internet as we have telecommunication system, which is still um, segmented at its borders. Well, this is not the case with internet. Although the governments can do censorship on internet, uh, they still have a hard time to do this uh, because of the internet's um, ubiquitous infrastructure, which is spread and it's, um, it's, there is no one local point that you can really touch there. Uh, Europe, of course, um, has done many, many efforts in order to keep the free internet alive. Uh, we have to, we are talking all the time with our American and other democratic counterparts and um, we hope that uh, we also can uh, be more heard in those two global discussions. Uh, we should be more active in the Internet Governance Forum, in WISIS events and all other major events that we are uh, now coming up uh, in uh, 2025, uh, for instance. Mm -hmm. Maybe one uh, from Jacques Cruz Brandao. Um, who's asking um, a, a question that, that, that goes into the details of what we just discussed, I feel, uh, which is um, um, how can we further foster security by design and duty of care principles um, to better secure global supply chains and create a better resilience against cyber attacks? To what, to what extent is sort of this idea of security by design and duty of care uh, to what is extent are we managing to sort of implement that in in uh, in different industries and and um, and therefore great cybersecurity? I think the European certification framework, which was mentioned briefly in my presentation, is something which already uh, tries to do this. So we try to uh, have uh, certain standards for the products in the ICT uh, market that uh, uh, will have. Uh, a level of security and this will be also indicated uh, uh, on the product. Uh, so uh, we, we might uh, arrive to a situation one day like we have now with the climate and um, energy resource uh, or energy um, consuming uh, products. When we go to the you know, store and we are buying a fridge, then you have the different la labels of um, en energy consumption. So we might have the different labels of security also in those products in the future. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll pick up on one question from Vikrant, um, who asked a question essentially about sort of the, the balance between defense and offense, I guess, mm -hmm. um, which is a very interesting uh, topic in international discussions around norms as well. Uh, Vikrant essentially asks, uh, in the last days, we've seen um, a need uh, from certain um, uh, you know, a certain block of like-minded countries uh, to hack IT security systems. Uh, we've also seen, for instance, uh, Ukrainian cyber activists um, uh, being very engaged in trying to attack Russian infrastructure um, as part of, of the effort to, um, to push back on the Russian military invasion. Um, so the, uh, Vikrant's question is, um, does this mean that people will start feeling more skeptical about cybersecurity in the systems? 
and how should governments protect and address these situations where there is a need for um, uh, hacking, uh, but at the same time uh, keep sort of the the the, the protection of, of systems as the, or cybersecurity as a principle, keep it intact. I think this also relates to the question of whether governments should be allowed to hack back or conduct offensive cyber operations, and whether this sort of uh, diminishes the, the the strength of the argument of uh, in international norms. Yeah. Uh, again, I think here we have to differentiate between the peacetime and wartime, really clearly. So, because if we establish that there was some sort of hacking or which was unpropor unproportionate and use of force happened during peacetime, then uh, there is one path of activity. But if it happened with, uh, during wartime, which is um, already uh, declared international armed conflict, so the different rule set applies during the wartime. Uh, combatants can use um, different methods and tools to attack and counterattack during wartime in order to defend themselves. Uh, as far as they are uh, strictly limited to military purposes, and do not harm uh, civilian critical infrastructure. This is, uh, I think, uh, the IHL principles have to be then applied in, in wartime. Uh, international humanitarian law uh, has to be applying, uh, or uh, law of armed conflicts has to be applying there, uh, especially uh, the protection of the civilians and civilian infrastructures. Uh, during peacetime, uh, we have not seen too much of this kind of um, vigilante hacking or uh, or um, hacking by um, crowds. Uh, so I think this is certainly now happening, yes, because of the war. Um, and um, uh, all sorts of hackbacks and all sorts of counter um, attacks during peacetime need to be um, proportionate. So the, I, I think it's the, also international law is setting the clear limits. There is the law of state responsibility, which is saying, what countries can do and what countries cannot do uh, in this time. So I uh, gave you a very legalistic answer because uh, I think this is this gives a frame for the conduct. It's 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 an interesting uh, answer uh, for sure. Let me just turn keep keep um, uh, the focus on the international uh, the question around international law. Um, and um, ask you about the, the ongoing discussions at the UN level uh, about the cybercrime treaty uh, that were started um, originally as, as proposed by Russia and, and, and now morphed into uh, sort of have overlapped with what the work of the UNGGE and now, now have gone their, their separate track. Um, my question, my question um, about that is, um, how do you, where do you expect this, this discussion to end on the cybercrime treaty? And are you confident that sort of the, the, the block of um, like-minded countries to which Estonia uh, is, is a part uh, will be able to to defend its its idea of an open, uh, secure, and interoperable internet. Um, and um, and yeah, how do you see this this happening? I also know that now that you're no longer a diplomat, you can speak more freely uh, than than when you were a diplomat. So uh, that makes the the answer uh, um, more interesting. Yes, yeah, you. Uh, I'm still tran transitioning myself to, from the government role to different uh, new roles. So. I'm joking, but uh, I think um, on the on the UN Cybercrime uh, Treaty or Convention, uh, certainly UN uh, would be uh, needing this kind of convention. But this convention needs to be also uh, respecting the human rights and individual freedoms, and and making sure that uh, it doesn't have clauses which uh, are helping the authoritarian countries to discriminate um, and uh, basically uh, legitimize the control uh, over its population. So this is the worry that we have with the UN Convention. Uh, we um, need to work together with the global community to make sure that this com uh, convention is, uh, is the best option and it's not going to serve the authoritarian part of our global UN membership, which is increasing with every day. So therefore, I think um, the good news is that um, the uh, different countries in this group uh, also have acceded the Budapest Convention already, which is uh, Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, and, uh, and many African and Latin American countries are also part of it or have taken this as a blueprint. So 
and they have an idea how this um, addressing cybercrime and what kind of legislation should work there. So um, many European countries are doing lots of um, efforts in order to have this uh, um, block of, um, of democratic countries and also the developing nations who have been already um, using the Budapest as the blueprint so that we can take this kind of um, model also uh, as a basis of the, of the UN Convention, because uh, our biggest concern certainly is that uh, we don't to want to end up with the UN Convention that uh, will legitimize the rising digital authoritarianism. Is the, um, is the, 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 we've reported a lot about, about the, the United States um, uh, role in this cyber diplo diplomacy uh, coalition and in, in this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know uh, Chris Painter very well, who led that effort uh, during the Obama uh, administration. Uh, but with the Trump administration and in the early day, early uh, months of um, of the Biden administration, the focus um, uh, was not so much on on this cyber diplomacy. Uh, I believe my colleagues in Washington have reported that this is now taking off in Washington as well. There is um, uh, more effort in in establishing cyber diplomacy office. Uh, but do you feel the United States is ready for this discussion at UN level, which is now very much taking off and speeding speeding up? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, my answer is that the United States has been always ready. It's just that because of the Trump uh, era, they have abolished this kind of uh, post or position in the White House. And majority of the observers outside uh, government circles did not see the very... Um, hardworking, uh, very good American experts who continued working even during that time. So the US has never been gone on, from this scale. Um, maybe it was not represented at the highest level, yes, and uh, this was because of the Trump era. But now I am very glad to see that the State Department, yes, has um, created already officially, or the Congress has created because they give the money uh, the Bureau uh, for Cyber Diplomacy and New Technologies. The plan is to um, uh, have a designated ambassador leading this effort uh, with also some special envoys helping. Uh, and I think uh, once uh, Trump administration um, has appointed um, all the other important <laughs> positions in its administration, they also will reach those cyber jobs and they will appoint um, the leaders and uh, and all these uh, very good friends of mine who are still working in the United States on these issues then will continue working on these issues. So. Great. Let me pick up uh, one more question from the audience and just remind the audience that we have about seven minutes left. So if you want to ask a question now, it's probably the right time because afterwards we might not get to it. Um, but there was one more outstanding question by Jacques Cousa Brandao. Um, and um, Jacques' question is, um, how can we deal with different encryptions in different regions to be able to reduce intellectual property theft in products sold globally? Um, I guess um, this question um, uh, relates to how can we technically protect our IP um, across the world and, and it, are there broader uh, methods of protecting IP that are maybe beyond technical? Thank you. There are certainly methods uh, to protect IP which are beyond technical, but I think um, uh, on this IP that um, related to supply chain, so we already have seen this with the 5G discussions, how uh, countries in Europe have uh, been waking up one by one and have started to apply the restrictive regulations in order to um, have a certain 5G technology that comes from trusted vendors, as we call it. And, um, and, and this, I think, is a trend that we are um, going to see much more geopolitical technology. Um, we already have this kind of standardization um, competition going on between the, again, West and the more authoritarian bloc. And, um, and my prediction is that this will increase. And I hope it is also might happen that um, at some point we are not able to uh, hold together this one global interoperable internet. And, and, and we will have then Chinese internet and then European one uh, together with the other democracies and <laughs> we might get there. But as for the um, uh, supply chain issues, I think this is um, 
quite an early debate right now. And uh, certainly uh, this um, decisions that we have seen in recent years uh, are suggesting towards the uh, more critical uh, equipment and more critical parts uh, of our networks uh, than uh, uh, supplied from trusted vendors, yes. Uh -huh. I was still very too diplomatical right now. I didn't even mention any countries. <laughs> um, great. Um, maybe um, I've got um, uh, one more question then, and then a final question, which is a little bit more com contemplative. Um, but I see um, Joran just uh, just send in a last question, and and I promised the audience um, that they would have a last chance. So I, I will take take that on. Uh, so Joran's last question is, what's your thought on the initiative of um, Ukrainian ICANN spokesperson who asked to deactivate all of Russian domains? It's quite an interesting question. Yes, this is an interesting question, yes. Uh, and uh, um, I know it's very difficult to do because uh, internet is built in a way that it's almost impossible to take it down. This was the reason why internet was um, created in the first place, to survive the nuclear war. So, uh, or to survive some major catastrophe and make sure that the data will be replicated in many servers at the same time and, and there is still the communication network up, even if something is uh, somewhere missing. So, uh, therefore, I'm not sure that it's te technically very easy to do it, but as we see the conflict unfolding and, um, and as we see also our powerlessness to do anything about it. I wouldn't rule out that these kind of measures could be also applied this. Do you feel it would it would change, it would move the goalpost of where Europe thinks, because for instance, there's an, the NGO community is already calling that, uh, calling out against the idea of shutdowns uh, in, in, in Russia. I think we also have to uh, consider the fact that there are many very um, um, nice people in Russia who might also suffer because of this kind of regime. So we also have to also think about this factor that uh, if, we, if we close down the last communication channel that they can uh, use in order to freely communicate with each other. Yes, so I agree that this is maybe not, um, or it, it is detrimental uh, to this final small space of freedom that people have in Russia. Mm -hmm. so that they can chat with each other over the encrypted channels uh, over the internet. If you take that away, then it will be like Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a last question here, because I think uh, that we will have to wrap up. Uh, you mentioned it uh, in, your, in, your opening, um, uh, in your opening lecture, um, and uh, I want to wanna ask you about this. Um, I think there was a time when uh, there were the happy internet days, as you call them. Um, and Estonia as a country has been has been sort of seen as a cheerleader of, of the power of technology and and uh, and and um, um, of um, of digital digitalization. Um, in the cybersecurity community, people often have a very different view on things and often are more skeptical or more cynical um, about uh, the internet. Uh, but you seem to be balancing those two sides. Um, maybe it's your Estonian nature. Um, I don't I don't know. Uh, but my question is, how how do you balance those two sides of sort of the good of technology versus the the harm that it uh, it can cause uh, across the world? Well, I showed you the quote by Steve Jobs, right? I think this is uh, why what I believe in. We we be, we have to use the technology wisely. So and um, and we have to be able to make sure that um, first we will make. Um, more uh, secure technology where security and privacy are already uh, built in by uh, its design. Secondly, we have to um, take some regulation. Our governments have to step up with the regulation to make sure that those secure um, and better technologies will be preferred to weaker technologies that we now have in the markets. Uh, and third, we have to be able to find a way how we are um, uh, battling with uh, all the negative sides like cybersecurity issues, uh, national um, competition, uh, cyber warfare, um, uh, cyber crime, uh, which has taken away um, so much revenue from our companies and also all uh, the issues that we have, uh, how the 
social networks have affected our teenagers and, uh, and the negative uh, issues should be also addressed and, and this is our collective responsibility to address it. But I think uh, we cannot imagine the time when you did not have internet. Or do you want to go back to this time? <laughs> Great. I'll leave that to every audience member to, uh, to answer that question. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, it was my pleasure to moderate this. Thank you to the participants uh, for joining. I think that's the most important uh, thing. Um, and with that, I, I uh, either hand over uh, to um, the organization or um, I will thank everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, wonderful session. We really enjoyed it. See you next time. Thank you so much for the moderation. Thank you, Haley, for the insights. Thank you.